Intel's new mobile CPUs have really caught my attention. Dumb model numbers aside, they're built on Intel's smallest process node yet and feature Arc integrated graphics, promising incredible efficiency and performance for the next generation of micro machines. So why am I not more excited for this review? Uh... Okay, so I wouldn't blame you if you weren't savvy to the controversy around Ace Magic. I wasn't on either of the occasions that I made videos about their mini PCs last year, and it wasn't until I was in the process of reviewing a third that I got caught up on things. There are a ton of mini PC brands out there, no one name really stands out among the pack. You'd have thought that Ace Magic, formerly Ace Magician, is just the same as the rest of them. That was until accounts started coming in that some of this brand's mini PCs were triggering Windows Defender warnings. Apparently, it emerged some of these units had shipped with malware pre-installed, and although Ace Magic issued a statement that they'd resolve the problem and that they'd be issuing full or partial refunds to customers, I'm sure it did a lot of harm to their reputation. So, when Ace Magic reached out to offer a review sample of their new Core Ultra Equipped F2A, I was initially cautious. However, I saw an opportunity to do some good old fashioned due diligence. Intel have been dropping the ball on the mobile CPU front for a while, but the Meteor Lake series seems to be turning a corner for them, so this was an opportunity to see if not one, but two companies have been redeemed, or if you're better off shopping with their competitors. The F2A was supplied by Ace Magic for review free of charge, but they haven't told me what to say or previewed the review ahead of time, and it won't stop me from speaking my mind. At an MSRP of $1200 for the Ultra 7, or $1100 for the Ultra 5 version, this is priced as a premium tier product, and I'm gonna judge it as one. Including the unboxing experience. The overall standard of packaging is surprisingly high, with a nice black-orange colour mix that's very classy. And yet, there's still something off. The Ace Magic branding is only on the PC itself and an easily printed bit of cardboard. And every other surface where you'd expect the name Ace Magic to appear is just the words Mini PC. The practical reason for this is probably because it's sold under more than one brand name. Ace Magic share an OEM with at least one other company, and if this weren't an allegedly $1200 computer, it'd almost be funny. Inside we have the PC itself, a very generic guide that could be for almost any mini PC, and a box of accessories including the power brick with a Euro plug, thanks for that, an HDMI cable and a Visa bracket. At the heart of the F2A is the new Intel Ultra 7 155H, based on Meteor Lake architecture. Like all recent Intel CPU generations, it has a bewildering array of cores for different levels of performance, with six hyper-threaded performance cores capable of boost frequencies up to 4.8 GHz, eight E cores without hyper-threading and a top frequency of 3.8 GHz, and two low-power E cores topping out at 2.5 GHz. The presence of these extra cores isn't the most exciting part for me. I was most interested in the new manufacturing process called Intel 4 that, while using a 7 nanometer node, has similar transistor density to a 4 nanometer process. Whether you buy that or think it's marketing nonsense, it's still the smallest process Intel have used so far, and given that their 10 nanometer chips struggle to hold their turbo frequencies in mini PCs, I for one am glad to see this new process in action. Graphics are provided by the new Arc Xe iGPU, with 128 execution units at up to 2250MHz as well as offering hardware encoding and decoding for all the latest video codecs, including AV1, this promises to have at least some of the gaming chops of Intel's discrete graphics cards. While I wouldn't expect A770 or even A580 levels of performance, I'd hope for something that would at least compete with the current class leader, AMD's Radeon 780M. In the same vein as AMD's new 8000 series APUs, 
The Meteor Lake chips also boast Neural Processing Units, or NPUs, to accelerate machine learning applications, though due to something of a lack of commercially available ways of benchmarking NPUs on Windows, I'm afraid I don't really have much to say about that. The unit itself is actually pretty huge, and I'm not necessarily complaining. Some mini PCs have proven to be too mini, and I'm glad that my first experience with the Ultra 7 class CPU is going to have some decent cooling. At least, I hope that's why the footprint is so relatively large, because it's got sod all to do with connectivity. On the front side we have the lone Type-C port, and it's only USB 3.2 meaning it's of no use for Thunderbolt devices like external GPUs. The Ace Magic site doesn't give much detail on what exactly this Type-C port can do, and while I found it can supply power and display to a monitor, I wasn't able to confirm if it's possible to power the mini PC itself this way. There are another two 3.2 ports on the front, this time Type-A's, as well as the obligatory 3.5mm audio jack. On the rear are another two USB 3.2 Type A's, two HDMI 2's and a 1 gigabit Ethernet port. I would have expected more from a mini PC packing the latest silicon and with such a high MSRP, though that last part is a little deceptive. Like most of its competitors, Ace Magic indulges in the slightly questionable practice of pricing their products high but offering deep discounts. There's a code for $300 off in the description, and I'd be inclined to treat that discounted price as the real one. Otherwise, this is a $1200 mini PC that lacks USB 4, HDMI 2.1 and 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. And even with fancy Meteor-like CPUs, that's a tough sell. Gaining access to the interior is refreshingly simple. The four rubber feet have ribs along the edge and are actually thumb screws to allow the bottom plate to come off. Once inside, being careful of the fan cable, we can see the socketed RAM, consisting of a pair of 16GB DDR5-4800 sticks. Again, this is a corner I wouldn't expect to see cut quite so much on a premium priced unit. Every Ryzen 7000 or 8000 series unit I've ever been sent came with DDR5-5600. There's the included NVMe SSD, which is, again, nothing to write home about, as well as a slot for a second drive. Setting up the F2A, I took a little more time than usual. I'm not going to relitigate the whole malware issue again, but trust has to be earned, you know. I did immediately run Defender with the latest definitions downloaded from Microsoft, and if you're at all concerned, it might be easiest just to take the opportunity to do a complete fresh Windows install to be on the safe side. Continuing the theme of being overly cautious, I know from my experience with the Core 5125H that this generation of Intel chips doesn't power throttle like the old 14 nanometer and 10 nanometer chips did, and yet I still felt the need to do my usual 10 passes through CPU Z, just to be on the safe side. Sure enough, there's remarkably little variance in the multi core results, whereas previous i7s would PL throttle after a couple of passes, causing a visible loss in performance over time, this new Core 7 can happily hold the line throughout the whole sequence. The Ultra 5 impressed me in Cinebench R23, and the Ultra 7 does even more so. This is the first CPU I've tested that scores 18,000 in the multi-core test after a 10 minute run, faster than the latest Ryzen 7 8845HS by about 10%. The single core test is only among the best I've tested rather than the best, but it's all splitting hairs really. Geekbench 6's results are distinctly less noteworthy though after the Ultra 5 only matched a previous gen i9, I didn't expect a whole lot. The 12.5k multi-core score isn't bad by any stretch, but not the domination seen in Cinebench. Geekbench's graphics tests are a mixed bag. The OpenCL result sees the Arc XE graphics comparing favourably to the Radeon 780M, and more than double the best score seen on an Iris XE. The Vulcan score was a bit of a letdown falling more than 8,000 points short of the best AMD had to offer, and only matching their generation before last. 
Geekbench ML is still a new test for me, but I have a few relevant points of comparison. The CPU test shows the Ultra 7 only taking a 10% lead over the Ultra 5 and is 25% short of the Ryzen 7. In the GPU test, things got weird. The 128 EU GPU in this supposedly higher performing Ultra 7 fell about 13% below the 96 EU version. I retested a couple of times and I can't really say exactly why this is the case. Finally, the NPU test is absent from the desktop version of Geekbench ML for the time being, so while this is one of the most touted aspects of the latest CPUs, I can't actually give you any data for it. The 3D Mark results are proving to be yet another great success for Meteor Lake, especially Time Spy. The Ultra 7 scores 3618 overall, the highest yet for a mini PC on my test bench. At least until either someone sends me an Ultra 9 unit, or unless the Ryzen 9 8945HS is a big surprise. The Firestrike score of 7181 is about 10% behind the previous gen Ryzen 9, which is a bit of a letdown, but still respectable. Both of these high scores were made possible by some very high GPU scores. Not just high for Intel chips, but even compared to Radeons. With numbers this good, this means the 155H should be great for gaming. Right? Well, we'll come to that. Work comes first, and the DaVinci Resolve tests are about what you'd probably expect considering the results so far. The CPU test is a winner, with the H.264 render completing 14 seconds ahead of the Ryzen 7 and almost 50 seconds ahead of the Ultra 5. However, the GPU-based renders see the 155H come in a close second to the 8845HS. The H.265 test is 28 seconds behind the Ryzen, though it does handily beat both the 125H and the old 12th Gen i9. The AV1 render only works on current Gen i GPUs, so between the three contenders, the Ryzen and Ultra 7s are pretty much a wash. In the Blender test, the F2A takes the rest of the mini PC lineup to school. See what I did there? The classroom render completes in 5 minutes 30, 5 seconds ahead of the best Ryzen I've tested so far, and almost 2 minutes ahead of the next fastest Intel. Gaming is kind of a mixed bag. I don't do comparison charts for these tests, as my chosen games can be pretty variable over time and surprisingly hard to benchmark scientifically, but I will say that the 85 FPS average in Apex Legends at 1080 low makes for a very playable experience, and is a great result, if you've never heard of AMD. The high scores in Geekbench and Time Spy might have led you to think the ARC graphics would dominate, but in truth this result is on par with a Radeon 680M. Battlebit Remastered is an entirely different kettle of fish. On potato settings, the graphics in this game are particularly spartan, meaning the 155H's CPU cores really get to shine. The average score across a couple of games was 186 FPS, more than 20% ahead of anything else I've tested so far. And things fell off a cliff again for Counter-Strike 2. Well, I'm exaggerating, but the 99 FPS average at 1080 low isn't even the best result from an Intel chip. For some bizarre reason, the Ultra 5 has taken the crown from its brother, leading by almost 10%. Not an earth-shattering difference, but a measurable one. Once again, it took three attempts to get a run at Fortnite that was anything approaching stable, and even then the 155H couldn't give a stutter-free experience here. Still, the 127 FPS average is a healthy step up from previous gen Intels, which largely struggled to get close to 100 on average, and in more power-limited cases often languished in the 60s, so I can appreciate that this is a great result in that context it's still a bit lower than the Ryzen's, which also tend to stutter less. Overwatch 2 rounds out the lightweight titles, and at 1080 low, the F2A enjoys a very acceptable 93 FPS average with lows over 60. 
I find performance in this game varies quite a bit from map to map, so even though I took an average across several matches, it's probably not fair to say that this is 7% slower than the 125H. Still, it is in the same ballpark as the lower end chip, which is pretty disappointing. I actually initially tested Forza Horizon 5 first. My Ultra 5 experience had left me hopeful that the Ultra 7 would be able to hit 60 FPS at 1080 high, like the Ryzen's do. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. At the same settings as the 125H, and indeed the 8845HS, it averaged 36 FPS, 5 frames less than the lower spec Ultra 5, and 23 lower than the Ryzen 7. Adding XCSS doesn't help a lot. For one thing, these iGPUs don't support XMX, so this is the same DP1A version you'd get running XCSS on any other brand of non-Intel iGPU. Jesus, I think that's more acronyms than I've ever used in a sentence before. Dropping to 1080 low reaches a slightly more acceptable 50+, plus, but this is still lower than I'd like. I don't know why this is so bad, whether it's a driver thing or if it's related to power management, but it doesn't look good. As always, when talking about mini PCs, there are two conclusions to come to. Firstly, the CPU itself. The Ultra 7 155H is, selectively at least, the best mobile CPU I've tested so far. In CPU intensive use cases and pretty much any GPU test other than gaming, it's genuinely impressive how it performs and how efficient it is while doing so. I think that it's fair to say both this and the Ultra 5 bode pretty well for future Intel releases on both mobile and desktop, and paired with a proper GPU, I think this could be a real contender for gaming too. Alas, with the Arc XE graphics in their current state, they don't really compete with the Radeon equivalents, and whatever restraints Ace Magic have put on the iGPU mean it doesn't seem to be capable of reaching what potential it does have. Regarding the Ace Magic F2A itself, I have some notes. For the price, even after the discount, there's more cut corners than I'd expect. Plenty of stuff like plastic construction, dated port selection, and even generic packaging logos would be acceptable at half the price. But at close to a grand, they're kind of galling. Ignoring the peripheral concerns and looking purely at performance, I don't have any context for how the 155H performs against other mini PCs with the same chip. But from what I can tell, it maintains clock speeds and keeps pretty reasonable temperatures. It could probably regulate those temps better if the fan was on a curve, rather than stepped. That means that it can flip from low RPM to high RPM and back again multiple times per minute to maintain a desired temperature, which is about the most annoying behaviour a fan can have. I'm not even bothered by the noise itself, especially as it seems to be doing a pretty fantastic job of keeping things cool, but the constant ramping up and down makes a nuisance of itself real quick. Forgiveness over the whole virus debacle isn't mine to give. I can only judge Ace Magic by the PC I have in front of me, and that happens to be a unit that's underspecified for its price, even with an apparent discount. There are some signs of polish here and there, but they ultimately serve only to highlight the rougher patches. I would love to be able to recommend this on the strength of the CPU alone, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows for the Ultra 7 either. That means the F2A is most attractive for people who need a lot of productivity horsepower, but aren't too concerned over connectivity? And who have pretty deep pockets, and maybe a hearing problem. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.